Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. So they went running to the tomb. And when the disciples went back to their homes, Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord. She turned around and saw Jesus, but did not realize it was him. Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've, if you've carried him away, just tell me where he is so I can go get him. But Jesus said to Mary, and she turned toward him and cried out, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Mary went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and he is risen. Happy Easter. And you know, as, as Christians, this is a huge moment for us. This is what we bank our faith on. This is what we put our hope in. That Christ is risen and Christ is risen indeed. So I just want to welcome you to Crossroads Church this morning. Happy Easter to all of you who can stand as we gather together to worship.
celebrate that your story did not end in that tomb. So neither do ours. God, we thank you that you are risen. And we pray, Lord, that today as we come to celebrate Easter, that you would do your awesome and mighty work in our lives. That you would transform us just as you transformed that solemn morning to a day of praise. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit continue to move in us and work in us, transforming our lives so that we might be more like you, that we might share the hope that we have with one another and with the world. God, we thank you. We come to celebrate. We come to say hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, and Christ is risen in me. So we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And at this time, we are going to dismiss our children to head on down the hall for our kids' own worship with Miss Kayla. Uh, we don't have a traditional Sunday school here at Crossroads Church. Our kids have fun during the service, and so, I don't know, some of the bigger kids, maybe you want to check it out sometime, too, like the adults know. <laughs> but they have a great time with Miss Kayla uh, down the hall, and then we've been doing something after church lately with the youth Sunday school as well. But I want to welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us today, coming here to Crossroads Church. I'm Pastor Gordon. If we have not met, uh, it is a pleasure to have you with us this morning in worship. Uh, we are Crossroads Church. We're Faith and Life Meet. Uh, you met Pastor Melissa doing our live welcome on our intro. We are glad to have David DeWitt and his brother Rob with us today. So this is your chance to say hi, Mom. Tune in online. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Hi, Helen. Glad to have your sons sharing their gift of music with us today in worship. I want to encourage you to take a moment, if you have not done so already, to go ahead and fill out that record of attendance, whether you grab the physical form, whether you're tuning online, you want to click that registration link, or if you're here in person, you can scan that QR code, or you can go ahead and grab a physical form as well. Just a simple way to let us know that you are here today for worship. Uh, there's a chance to share your email address. If you'd like, you can be added to our weekly devotional uh, email list, and we'd love to send you a word of encouragement. But there's also a chance to share any prayer requests that you might have. Maybe there's something going on in your life today that you'd love to have someone to pray for you. We have a dedicated prayer team uh, that lifts those up every week. I want to highlight a couple of announcements. First, we are excited today. We are kicking off a new message series here at Crossroads Church called I Have Questions. Anybody have questions? When you read the Bible, do you ever have questions and go like, God, this doesn't make sense. I don't know if I understand. Well, we realize there's a lot of questions when it comes to our faith. And sometimes people like to pretend like they have all the answers. And then you realize, well, maybe they don't, right? And so we're going to explore some of these questions. Not that we have all the answers, but we're going to learn how sometimes our doubts can lead us on a journey to deeper faith. And so we're kicking that series off today. Definitely come back uh, next week as we uh, continue our series next week. Uh, question is, where was my miracle, right? Seems like everybody else experiences the miracle, but where is my miracle? So we're going to wrestle with that uh, next week. Also coming up next week, we are going to have our official chartering Sunday. Uh, next Sunday marks the nine-year anniversary of when we launched weekly services here at Crossroads Church up in the market. So let's give it up to all the people that put their blood, sweat, and tears into this thing. So what does that mean? It's a, it's a celebration of the hard work that's gone before us to help us reach that point of sustainability. We will be uh, receiving our first official charter members. And that's one of those necessary steps that if we ever want to go ahead and pursue purchasing land or take out a loan from the bank. We need to have a certain number of ne uh, members and people that can vote on that. And so we are celebrating that uh, next Sunday. And then finally, I want to thank you so much for your generosity, for your support. Your gifts are making a difference here in Elk and Market and the surrounding uh, community. We do not uh, pass the offering plates here anymore at uh, Crossroads Church, but we do have a little wooden offering box that if you're saying, you know what, I'm new, but you know what, uh, Pastor Gordon needs like a new whatever, it is. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you want to see work and support the ministry here at Crossroads Church, you can leave a gift in the offering box there and uh, know that your gifts are making a difference, whether it's through ministry that we do with people that are struggling, people going through addiction, people maybe struggling with the relationships, maybe it's the work that we're doing with our kids and, and providing Bibles for children or youth group or whatever it is, your gifts are making a difference in people's lives. 
And so we want to thank you for your generosity. We wouldn't be able to celebrate nine years of sustainable ministry here at Elkin Market without all that has gone before us. And so we want to take a moment to say thank you. If you have your Bibles with you today, we're going to be looking at the Easter story found in the Gospel of John. And so John chapter 20 is where we find our account uh, for this morning uh, for the Easter story. Now, I'm going to have a little moment of confession here. I got some flowers. But there's a reason that Pastor Melissa is the one who usually handles flower bouquets in the family, right? Because uh, how many of you have ever received a gift of flowers that looks something like this? <laughs> Not quite, hon, huh, right? I, I bring these flowers here today because, well, <laughs> what do you do with old, dying, decaying, kind of gross-looking flowers? What do you do with your flowers when their life has expired, right? For most people, we probably would just toss these away. Right? By now, they're kind of decaying. They might even be starting to get moldy. They're kind of like garbage, right? You throw them in a pile, you throw them in a trash heap. Maybe if you're conscious, you, you have a garden and you want to compost them and make, you know, healthy soil. Maybe if the arrangement is something special in your life, you might uh, go ahead and, like, dry out your wedding bouquet. Uh, I'm not sure. Melissa, do we still have the wedding bouquet or has it fallen apart by now? Well, it lasted about 10 years. It lasted about 10 years. I see, I've seen some people do these really cool like pressed box things or these shadow boxes. And so like if it's something really important, maybe you find a way to preserve it or maybe it's from a memorial from a loved one and so you dry it out, right, and you try to hang on to it. But for all other damaged, dying, decaying flowers, typically they end up in the landfill. Well, one UK artist, though, has a passion for bringing dead flowers back to life. No, she doesn't like replant them and they grow again. No, Rebecca Louise Law has transformed dead flowers into a wonderful work of art. And so we've actually got a couple of images here. Collaborating with hundreds of community volunteers in Cleveland, Ohio, Law has transformed over 500,000 dried flowers into this beautiful exhibit of art, carefully stringing them together to form one piece of a larger exhibit that comes together as a whole which people can actually go ahead and like walk through this. I think I have a picture to kind of give some perspective. People can immerse themselves in this beautiful work of art. We love a good resurrection story, don't we? If we hear something as simple as dry flowers can inspire us to rediscover a unique beauty that each flower still holds. And as I came across this story, I couldn't help but think about like the Easter message, right? How through Jesus, God can bring the dead back to life, taking our individual lives and weaving it together in a larger part of a tapestry of a beautiful creation that God is doing. Each one of us shaped by God and given new life. But these pictures alone can't really do the artwork justice, right? We don't feel that magical moment of walking through these flowers. We're only looking at a picture. Our perspective is kind of limited. It's one thing to admire the work of art through images or to check it out online, but it's an entirely different thing to be able to experience it, to be able to live it, to touch it, to see it, to smell it, to walk through it. And as we come to this Easter story today, we find someone who didn't just want to hear about Jesus' resurrection, he didn't want to just hear that Jesus was risen. He wanted to experience a risen Savior for himself. And so if you have your Bibles with you today, we're going to look at the story of Thomas after Jesus rises from the dead. And in John chapter 20, beginning at verse 24, we read this. But Thomas, who is called Didymus, or the twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came to them. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hand, and I put my finger in the marks of the nails in my hand on his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples 
were again in the house, and Thomas was with them, although the doors were shut. Jesus came and he stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but, to, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, if John was known as the disciple whom Jesus loved, I think Thomas is the, is the disciple that we all can relate to, right? Thomas is that kid in your eighth grade algebra class who had the courage to raise their hand and say, teacher, I have no idea what you're talking about, right? You guys remember that student? Maybe you were that student. Maybe you wished for that student in your class and you'd be a whole lot better at math now if you had that student. If it wasn't for people like Thomas in our life, there's a whole lot in this world that we want to understand. Thomas is that disciple who questions, who asks the questions that everybody else is thinking, but they're too afraid to ask. And so when Jesus told his disciples that he was going to prepare a place for them, it was Thomas who said, um, Jesus, what do you mean you were preparing a place and we know the way? Jesus, we have no idea where you're going. How can we possibly know the way to where you are going unless someone were to show us, right? And when Lazarus had died and Jesus wanted to go with him, the disciples were like, yeah, Jesus, do you remember what the, happened the last time you tried to go there? They tried to kill you. Jesus, are you sure you really want to go back there? And Thomas said, all right, let's go with him that we might die with him. He goes ahead and names what everybody else is thinking. Thomas was the one who gave voice to what they were all thinking and feeling. And so when Jesus appears to all the other disciples, can we be surprised that with Thomas's protest, right? We all have questions. I don't know if I should tell you this, but Bible college and seminary did not teach me everything I needed to know about the Bible or about God or about Jesus or the faith, okay? You guys can all do a big shock of God's like, oh, I can't believe he doesn't know it, right? I thought they knew everything. I thought that's why they went to, like, master of divinity, doesn't that mean you have, like, the master of the divine thing? No, right? I still have questions. But just because we have questions, that doesn't necessarily make us a fool. By the way, tomorrow is April Fool's Day. Not wise to do April Fool's jokes on your parents, especially... If you're still, like, searching for your Easter basket, you might never find it, all right? So Easter Fool, or April Fool's is tomorrow, right? Having questions doesn't make us a fool. Leaving them unexplored does. So how do we reconcile our questions with our faith? Can we be a Christian still, even if we have doubts, right? But not all doubts are bad. In fact, a little doubt might be just what we need to go a little deeper in our faith, to discover that deeper faith. Now, unfortunately, let's be honest and say that the church hasn't always been favorable with doubts, right? We've kind of discouraged questions and doubts and exploring. Maybe you grew up in the kind of church where you were taught to just believe and to have faith like a child. Did anybody ever hear that one before? Faith like a child. Have faith like a child. Do you remember what it was like when you were a kid? Do you remember what it was like when your kids were little? They asked questions about everything, right? Why is the sky blue? Why, why does the grass come up green? Why this? Why this? What's going to happen when I die? What's heaven going to be like, right? And we ask all kinds of questions. I remember when I was a kid, I was full of all kinds of questions, and my poor mom tried to answer them the best she could. I have questions that I probably couldn't even answer today if my kids were to ask me, but thankfully the people in my life didn't feel the need to silence my questions or to have all the answers. Some things are still a mystery to us, but I would never have discovered faith if I didn't have questions. Questions are great because they help us press deeper to search for answers and can help us discover that deeper faith. When Jesus appeared to the disciples, Thomas missed it. He wasn't there. 
John doesn't tell us why he wasn't there with the rest of the disciples hiding behind locked doors. He doesn't tell us what he was doing. Maybe Thomas had stepped out for a snack. Maybe he went out to get supplies for the rest of the group. Maybe he was out investigating the report for himself and trying to find out who stole Jesus' body and where they took him so that they might bring him back. Maybe he was too afraid of being caught with all the other disciples. And so, kind of like the designated survivor, he was off in a room by himself. So that somebody, if they found the disciples, could carry on the story. Or maybe he was the only one with the courage not to hide behind locked doors. We don't know where Thomas was. But when he comes back, and all the other disciples are there and excited to tell him what happened, you can't believe he missed it. it. It was like that moment where you step out during the big game to like grab a hot dog or a snack or use the restroom and suddenly you hear the crowd erupt, right? And you know that something significant has happened and you missed it. And there's nothing worse than missing the big moment than coming back to your seat and having to hear all about how I can't believe you missed that shot. I can't believe you missed it. He hit a grand slam and you were out getting a hot dog, right? And I wonder if that's what it was like for Thomas here. Can we blame him for his protest? Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and I put my finger where the nails were and put my hand onto his side, I will not believe it. And for that, he is known as Doubting Thomas. But maybe Thomas's protest has less to do with what he believes about Jesus and more to do with what he has experienced himself. You see, Thomas hasn't been afraid to speak up, to express what he is thinking or feeling. And as I hear Thomas's protest in the Easter story, I can't help but hear a man who longs to experience that risen Savior for himself, just like everybody else had a chance to experience. How much opposition of faith do we encounter that really comes from someone who just longs to experience Jesus for themselves? We hear it often expressed in protests like, that if God is so loving, then why didn't he protect my loved one? You ever hear that one before? Or if God is so good, then why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? Probably have heard that. If God is so powerful, then where is my miracle? If God is real, if Jesus is risen, then why do I feel so dead inside? Maybe our objections come from a place of longing, a longing for a God who really could come back from the dead. Thomas doesn't want to rest his faith on what others have experienced. He wants to know that risen Savior for himself. And can we blame him? You see, we shouldn't rely solely on someone else's experience of Jesus. We should long to experience that risen Savior for ourselves to experience Christ for ourselves. And while we might know Thomas for his doubts, we appreciate him, at least for being the disciple that we all can relate to, the one who has represented us at one time or another in our journey. Thomas is the one who has the courage to take on his doubts. Not all doubts are bad. Some can lead us to that deeper faith experience. For our doubt isn't the end of our faith, but the beginning of a deeper journey with Jesus. As I was reading this story, I was thinking about the fact that it says seven days later, a week later, Jesus returns. All week long, Thomas had to wrestle with his doubts, to hear about how Jesus had appeared to others, but not for, for him. And while this was exciting for the others to talk about, Thomas could only listen to what they experienced, trying to understand what could have happened, trying to make sense of everything. Why, Jesus, why didn't you appear, or why did you appear to everyone else but not me? What did I do to deserve this? Why did I have to miss out? Oh, how he would have longed to have been there. If only I could go back. If only I could do things differently, I would. Any of it sound familiar in our lives? We've been there before. 
maybe his doubt had less to do with Jesus and more to do with himself. You see, Satan loves to use our doubts against us, right? To twist them against us, to turn the conversation to one of shame, to cause us to question ourselves and to question God's love for us, causing us to give up, to lose hope, to grow bitter, maybe even turn away. Why is it so easy for us in our doubt to believe our fears and forget the promise? Thomas, don't you remember? You are the one that when Jesus was talking about going to prepare a way, you said, how do we know that way? Jesus said, what? He's going to come back. He goes to prepare a place so that he might come back and get them so that they may be where he will be. And then... Jesus returns. For several days, Thomas wrestled with his doubts before Jesus finally came to him. The story says a week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them this time. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he turns to Thomas and he says, Put your finger here. See my hands. Place your hand and put it on my side. Stop doubting me believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus doesn't waste any time, does he? He goes after, he goes, he goes and he calls out Thomas and he invites him to experience him as the risen Savior that he had been longing for. He addresses Thomas's doubts and he calls him to faith. You see, Jesus doesn't dismiss our doubts, he calls us to faith, doesn't he? When John introduces us to Thomas, we're given another name for him. Didymus, meaning twin. But twin of whom? Now I could ask our wisest Bible scholars here today, put them on the spot and ask them, who was Thomas's twin? And you know what they tell you? We don't know. We are never told what Thomas is the twin of, or who his sibling might be. We're not told anything about Thomas's family to help us understand, and yet we understand that these details are not insignificant. So it had me wondering at least one of those questions, what is Thomas a twin of? You see, while Thomas has come to be known for his doubts, to be known as Doubting Thomas, we can't forget the courage and the devotion that he had as well. Thomas has the courage to ask those questions and to wrestle with his doubts while still holding on to his complete devotion and commitment to Christ. Thomas wasn't interested in deconstructing his faith to tear it all apart and to be left with nothing. No, he was holding on to Jesus and exploring those questions and reconstructing a faith in a risen Savior for himself. He helps us understand that it is not our questions that make us a fool. For having the courage and devotion to turn to Jesus with our doubts leads us to a closer relationship with him. And so Jesus invites Thomas to place his fingers in the stars, to put his hand upon his side, and to see and experience that risen Savior. Thomas is quick to profess, my Lord and my God. His confident profession doesn't just come because he has seen Jesus. It comes from that deep wrestling, I think, that has taken place throughout his entire journey, leading him to this moment. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I don't think Jesus just says this for Thomas' sake. I think he says this for you and me. And for all who would come and follow. You see, your experience isn't going to look like everyone else's experience of Jesus. You're not walking the same journey that everyone else has taken. But Jesus invites you on a journey to experience that risen Savior for yourself. So I hope that you do have questions. We all should have a few, right? 
There should be a few things that have us searching, searching for answers in an uncertain world, but we can only find the answers we are looking for when we aren't too afraid to wrestle with our doubts. This doesn't mean we have to completely tear our faith apart, nor does it mean the end of our faith that we are weak or that our faith is crumbling. It is simply the beginning of a deeper journey with Jesus. And as we turn to Jesus and as we long for that meaningful encounter of our own, Jesus comes to us. Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. That's you. That's me, that's all of us. For we weren't there that Easter morning. But that doesn't mean we have to miss the risen Savior who is with us today. Let's pray. Jesus, we confess that at times in our life, it seems like our world has been full of doubts. There's a lot that we don't understand. There's a lot of questions that we wrestle with. And yet, Instead of dismissing our questions, Lord, we bring them to you. We pray that here in this moment that you will help us to experience your presence. To see that you have never given up on us. That you never stopped loving us. But you are big enough to handle our questions, our fears, our doubts, our anger. We come and we lay them all on the cross today. Because we believe in an empty tomb. We believe in an empty grave clothes. We believe in a Savior who is risen so that we might rise again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that we can gather on this Easter Sunday to celebrate all that you're doing and all that you will do and continue to stir that faith in us. as we press closer to you. Pray for all of us in here. We have a couple more songs that we are going to uh, close our service with. We hope that this service has been a blessing to you. If it is, we encourage you to come back and join us next week as we continue our series. Maybe you know somebody that has a few questions of their own or maybe some doubts that they've been wrestling with. Uh, you can check out the bulletin. We've got kind of our upcoming messages and series that we're going to be uh, dealing with as we tackle with those questions that we might have. And also, we want to just say a special welcome to our guests, that if you are new to Crossroads today, we'd love to meet you at the, the back welcome table. We have a little gift, a few gifts left uh, that we just love to say thank you so much for uh, joining us for worship. Catch your name. And we hope that you have a blessing.
invite you all to stand up for a closing song. Easter, have a great rest of your Sunday and hope to see you back as we continue the series.